Welcome. Our topic for today is the osteology of the visceral cranium. This is our study guide. We have definition, we have functions of the visceral cranium, we have the components of the visceral cranium. These are the structural components of the visceral cranium, and this include the maxilla, the nasal bone, the zygomatic, lacrimal, the inferior conchi the mandible, vomma, and the palatine bone. So take a look at this one after the other during the course of this lecture. The bony configuration of the head is the skull, and the skull is subdivided into two. We have the neurocranium and the visceral cranium. You can go and check up our lecture on the neurocranium. The neurocranium is the upper part, which is also referred to as the brain case, it accommodates the brain tissue, while the lower part, which forms the skeletal system of the face, is the visceral cranium. And this accommodates sense organs, which include the eye, the nose, the tongue, and so on. So we would be limiting our lecture to the visceral cranium, which is the facial skeleton. The functions of the visceral cranium, they give shape to the face. They also create site of attachment for muscle. And this is as we've discussed also for the neurocranium. They contain sinuses. Sinuses is contained within the bones of the neurocranium. And so we have it in the bones of the visceral cranium. We've said that the sinuses basically, they help to reduce the weight of the skull and they also help to enhance the resonation of sound. They also contain foramen. Foramen are for the passage of vessels. They also help to protect delicate organs. Delicate organs in this case are basically the sense organs, while in the neurocranium, it is the brain tissue. So the visceral cranium is made up of 14 bones in totality. We have six paired bones and we have two unpaired bones. And that's make up a total of 14 bones. If you sum this with the number of bones that we describe in the neurocranium, which are eight in number, you have a sum total of 22 bones in all, making the entire cranial bone, which includes the neurocranium, and the visceral cranium. So for the purpose of this lecture, we would be discussing just the visceral cranium and we have them listed on the screen. So we would take these bones one after the other to see their morphology and also where they are positioned. The maxilla. The maxilla are two in number. We have one on the right and one on the left. They tend to fuse together around the midline plane at the intermaxillary suture. This is the suture that tends to join the right maxilla with the left maxilla. The function of this bone is that they help to hold the upper dentation. You can see that the upper dentation is lined around their lower border. So the maxilla is centrally located in the face. The regions, they are made up of different regions. We have the body, the central region of the maxilla, and we have four processes. The maxilla presents four processes. These processes basically are to create extension for the attachment of neighboring bones. You can see that the facial skeleton is made up of different types of bone, whether paired or unpaired, and the maxilla needs to connect with them through this extension. So we have four processes. The maxilla has different kind of connection with bones around it. We have the zygomatic bone somewhere here. We have the frontal bone. So it needs to create extension to meet up with these bones. The first one is the zygomatic process. The zygomatic process is the extension that emerges from the maxilla to form a connection with the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic bone around here, and this is the zygomatic process. So this is the process that it creates to form a link with the zygomatic bone. Then we have the frontal process. The frontal process is also like an extension that it creates to form a link with the frontal bone. This is the frontal bone. And we have also the alveoli process. The alveoli process is on the inferior end of the maxilla. And that is the process that it creates like a number of indentation around its lower border to accommodate the upper dentation. So it creates like a socket for the teeth around this region. Then you have the palatine process. The palatine process, you need to turn the maxilla for you to 
to see this region. And that is why I've put this image down here. So this is the palatine process that forms the hard palate. The hard palate tends to like create a demarcation between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity above. So this is the process that extend on the inside from the maxilla on the outside. And this is the palatine process. So the process is basically are created to form extension for the maxilla to connect with the surrounding bone. And that is why you have this extension. You can see the extensions are names of bones that are seen around the maxilla. We have the infraorbital foramen. Remember we talked about the supraorbital foramen when we were discussing the frontal bone. We said that it allows for the passage of the supraorbital nerve, which is a branch of the frontal nerve, which emerges from the optamic branch of the trigeminal nerve. That is for the supraorbital foramen. In the maxilla, what we have in the maxilla is the infraorbital foramen from the name infraorbital below the orbit. So you can see this hole created below the orbit, but it is on the maxilla bone. And this foramen allows for the passage of the infraorbital vessel, the infraorbital artery, which is a branch of the external carotid, and also the infraorbital nerve, which is a branch of the maxillary nerve. The maxillary nerve is the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, and that is where this vessel starts through. Then we have the maxillary sinus. Remember we talked about the functions of the viscerocranium. We talked about all those spaces created within the bone, which helps to reduce their weight and also help to enhance voice resonation. So the maxilla also presents a sinus, which is referred to as the maxillary sinus. So we need to crack open the maxilla to see the maxillary sinus. We also have an incisive foramen. The incisive foramen is created behind the incisor teeth. This is the upper dentation that we say that the alveoli process of the maxilla accommodates. Just behind it, you have a canal. And this canal tends to create like a link between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity above so that vessels can move from the oral cavity to the nasal cavity to supply structures. And the vessels that pass through this incisive foramen are the greater palatine vessels and also the nasopalatine now. So they run through, those are the structures that the maxillary bone presents apart from their extensions. The nasal bone, the nasal bone are also two in number. They are oblong in shape. They are located around the midline of the face, just above the nasal region. And this is the nasal bone. There are one on the right and one on the left. What they do is that they form the base of the nose. So if you can do a physical examination, you can feel the nasal bone at the root of the nose. Then the zygomatic bone, this is called the cheekbone. It is located at the upper lateral part of the face. They have a prominence that they form around the cheek. You see some people with high cheekbone. It is the configuration of the zygomatic bone that has presented that form of configuration. The appeared bone, you have one on the right and one on the left. And as you can see, they accommodate also with a number of bones around them. You can see the frontal bone around this region. You can see the temporal bone, the maxillary bone in the front. So they also form a form of connection with these bones, which means that they will definitely be having processes. So the processes of the zygomatic bone are three. They have three processes. The first one is the frontal process, which is where they connect with the frontal bone by the side of the orbit. Then we have the temporal process where they connect with the temporal bone. And it is through the formation of the zygomatic arch. Then the maxillary process. This is the maxillary process where they connect with the maxilla. You can see the maxilla in the central face region, which the zygomatic bone then form extension to connect with them. The zygomatic arch. What is the zygomatic arch? The zygomatic arch is like a bridge of bone that extends from the temporal bone to the zygomatic bone. It tends to connect the temporal bone with the zygomatic. So it's like a bridge 
And what they do, their function basically is to protect the highs. It's like a guide that tends to prevent structures from going into the highs. And they also create a platform for mozu attachments. So masseta and part of temporalis mozu are connected to the zygomatic arch. This zygomatic arch is formed by two processes. There's actually a contribution from two bones. So we have the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Remember when we talked about the temporal bone being divided into two parts, the squamous and the pectorus. We say that the pectorus part undergoes some form of transformation, and one of which is the zygomatic process, which is a process that it extends to the zygomatic bone. So we have the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, then we have the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic bone. We also discussed or explained that they also present the temporal process that is extended to join with the temporal bone. So we have two processes here coming together to form the zygomatic hatch. One is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. So the two processes come together to form the zygomatic hatch that is found around the lateral wall of the face. The lacrimal bone, this is the smallest of them all and it is the most fragile. It is located in the anterior part of the medial wall of the orbit. This is the medial wall of the orbit and this tends to form a nasolacrimal canal for the translocation of tear. And we have the inferior nasal canchi. Remember when we talked about the ectomoid bone that forms part of the base of the neurocranium. We said that they present a form of elevation that are called conchae. We have the superior conchae and the middle conchae. The inferior conchae is a separate type of bone that is created around the nasal skeletal system. The inferior nasal conchae is seen below on both sides. So we have two of them on the right and on the left, but they are located inferior to the superior and the middle nasal concha. These concha are elevations that are created around the lateral wall of the nasal cavity to increase the surface area to perform the functions that the nasal cavity exhibits. But it is good for us to know that the superior and the middle nasal concha are formed by the ectmoid, while the inferior concha is a separate bone that is formed on its own. So it's not formed by the ectomoid, it stands by its own. The mandible, the mandible is the largest of all the facial bones, is the strongest, it forms the lower jaw and it also creates accommodation for the lower dentation. It is the only movable bone that we have in the facial skeleton. And this movability is to allow for chewing and also for talking process. I'm able to talk and also chew my food because my mandible has allowed a form of movement. The mandible is made up of different regions too. We have the body and the ramus. The body is the central region. Above the body, we have the alveoli process. The alveoli process are indentation that is also referred to as sockets that allows for the lower dentation to be implanted into. So it's great accommodation site for the lower dentation. The inferior border of the body is somewhat rounded and it tends to form the chin. So this is the body, the central part of the mandible. An extension is formed from the body. You see it extending upward. This is called the ramus. The ramus is further subdivided into two. We have the condylar process and we have the coronoid process. The coronoid process and the condylar process are separated by an indentation that is called the mandibular notch. So let's start with the coronoid process. The coronoid process is triangular in shape and it's basically for muscular attachment. Why the condyloid process presents a form of rounded edge and a constricted neck. The rounded edge enters into the mandibular fossa that we talked about in the pectoral part of the temporal bone. The mandibular fossa allows the head of the mandible to enter into it to form the temporomandibular joint. So this is the part of the mandible that fits into 
the mandibular fossa. We talked about the separation between the coronoid and condyloid process, which is the mandibular notch. This mandibular notch is not just there for fun. It allows the passage of the mesenteric vessels and nerves. Then the vomer. The vomer is a single type of bone. It runs vertically along the nasal cavity, separating it into the right and the left side. It is located in the mid sagittal plane of the nasal cavity, and this tends to form the inferior toe of the nasal septum. Also good for us to know that it is on this vomer that the cartilaginous part of the nasal septum rests on. How the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and this vomer that we just described form the bony part of the nasal septum. The nasal septum is divided into two parts. The nasal septum, of course, separates the nasal cavity into two. If you put your hand into your two nose rays and feel it around the midline, you feel a demarcation within it, and that is the nasal septum. And it tends to divide the nasal cavity into the right part and the left part. But this nasal septum is made up of two parts. It has a bony part and a cartilaginous part, which is made up of hyaline cartilage. The bony part is on the root, is below, while the cartilaginous part is above, and that is what you see. So this cartilaginous part is formed by hyaline cartilage and is located on top of the bony part of the nasal septum. The bony part is like the root and is created by bone. And that is why it is referred to as the bony part. But this bony part is formed by two bones. Remember when we described the morphology of our ethmoid, that we say that the perpendicular plate of ethmoid runs along from the cribriform plate. It runs downwards to separate the nasal cavity into two. So the upper part of the bony part is formed by that perpendicular plate of ethmoid, while the lower part is formed by the vomer that we just talked about. So the vomer forms like the inferior one third of the bony part of the nasal septum, why the perpendicular plate of hetmoid forms the superior two-third of the bony part. So the two bones, which are the perpendicular plate of hetmoid and also the vomer bone, form the root of the nasal septum. Then onto this bony alignment is where we have the cartilage resting upon. The palatine, the palatine are irregularly shaped bone and they are located behind the nasal cavity between the two maxilla and also the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. These are the limb process of the sphenoid. This is the palatine bone. The maxilla is somewhere at the central on the front. Then you have the nasal cavity also at the front. So it's located between this region. The palatine bone contributes to the formation of three cavities. It contributes to the formation of the oral cavity. It contributes to the formation of the nasal cavity and also the orbits. And it does this because it's able to articulate with five bones. And these five bones are responsible for the formation of these cavities. The maxilla with the sphenoid, with the ethmoid, with the inferior conchi, and also the vomer. And because of this articulation that it has with all these bones, it's able to contribute to the formation of the three cavities that we have around the facial skeleton. This is an exercise. We have what are the functions of the zygomatic hatch and what structures contribute to its formation. This is a double question with a double question mark. So we can try and track our brain around it. Also, write a descriptive note on all the bones of the facial skeleton. This is like a big one, so you need to take the bones one after the other. You talk about their morphology, their function, and also where they are placed. So that is it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Let's meet in our next class.